Very last section in this course, we're jumping to 9.3 and talking about the quadratic formula. You might have seen it before. All the stuff on the page looks intimidating, but don't worry about it. We're going to break it down step by step. But what is the quadratic formula? Where is it coming from and what do we use it for? So in the previous chapters, we were trying to solve quadratic equations of this form. And when I had everything on one side set equal to zero, what did we do? We factored the left-hand side. And then we used that zero product principle to be able to solve. Zero product principle. So if two things are being multiplied and it's equal to zero, either the first piece is zero or the second piece goes to zero. Okay. But sometimes this thing is not going to factor that nicely using integers. So whole numbers positive, negative, or zero. So we need another method. If I can't factor it, it's not going to help me solve for those values when it's quadratic. If they don't turn out to be nice. So we need another method. It's called the quadratic formula. So deriving that thing comes from completing the square, completing the square on that generic quadratic equation. So we start with that thing in the beginning, complete the square on it, and that forces the left-hand side to be a perfect square trinomial. Perfect square trinomial. Because when we have a perfect square trinomial, we can take the square root and start solving. So, follow along with me how we get to that quadratic formula. So in the very beginning, we have our generic quadratic equation. And what do we do to move from the first line to the second? So I had a constant a out on the front, or a coefficient of a, and we divided every single term by a. So that was our first step. Divide everything by a. So it's still legal, because I did it everywhere. Then what happened? Second to third. So we moved our C over A term to the other side. So we moved that constant. Move the constant. It's an ugly one, but it's still just a constant. C, A, and B, they're all just numbers. Then what happened? Then we made a perfect square trinomial. Make perfect square trinomial. And we don't have to worry about that process but I'm adding some piece to the left-hand side, and at the same time, I'm also adding it to the right. So it's still legal. And in doing that, it forces the left-hand side to be a perfect square trinomial, and we can factor it. So I can take that three term and turn it into square of a binomial. Then what? What do we do now? Whatever I did to one side, I had to do the other. So then we just combined our like terms over here. We had common denominators. We wrote them together. So we combined like terms. Then what? We need to dig out the x. And right now, it's buried underneath that power of 2. So if we take the square root of both sides, we introduce two different options because I both have a positive radical and a negative radical option. So we took, we used that square root principle, square root principle. Then what happened? Constant term that was on the left, we moved it over to the right. So I moved the constant again. And after that, we had common denominators, 2a and 2a, so we just combined like terms again. Combine like terms. So we don't need to worry too much about this process. I just want you to be able to follow along with the steps that we discussed. And we only really care about the beginning, what I'm starting with, and the very end. So if I have a quadratic equation in that form and it's not factoring, I can plug in those values into the quadratic formula and evaluate them out pretty quick. So if you go on to higher math, um, at this school at least, we will discuss more in detail how to complete the square 
and actually work through this process in more detail. But for now, we just care that we have that quadratic formula. So let's start using it. All right, so using that quadratic formula now, the solutions of that general quadratic equation are given by that formula. If we have the a, b, and c value, we can plug them in and evaluate just fine. So the very first example is that thing in that general quadratic equation form. Everything on one side set equal to zero. No, so what do we need to move? Negative three to the other side. When we do that, now it's set equal to zero. So the first step, we always need it in that general form. Step one, put it in that general form. Once we have that now, we can pluck off the a, b, and c value because that's all that we need in our quadratic formula. So a in this case is five, b is negative eight, the sign always goes with the term, and c is positive three. Once we have those, we're literally just plugging it into the quadratic formula and evaluating out. So let's start. X equals negative B. So negative of negative 8 gives me positive 8. And I have two options, plus or minus the square root of B squared. So negative 8 times negative 8 is positive 64 minus 4 times a, which is 5, times c, which is 3. And you can evaluate like this as we're going along. And that's all over 2 times a, 2 times 5, down below there. And that's super ugly form. We want to make it nicer, simplify down as far as we can go. So I've got x equals 8 plus or minus the square root of what on the inside there? 64 and I'm subtracting off what value? So 15 times 4 will give me 60, and that's all over 10. Just simplifying as we go. All right, let's keep going. I've got 8 plus or minus the square root of 4 all over 10. And what is the square root of 4? 2 all over 10. So I've got two different options. I've got 8 plus 2 over 10. So x is going to be equal to 8 plus 2 over 10, which is going to give us what? 1. Or x is going to be equal to 8 minus 2 over 10, which comes out to be 6 tenths. And we can simplify that down, taking out a factor of 2 from each, 3 fifths. So we always have those two options. Now could you imagine trying to factor and get that combination of one and the fraction three-fifths to multiply a pain in the butt? So the solution set, three-fifths and one. Those are the values that we can plug in to our general form equation over here and make it actually be equal to zero. And if you're not convinced, you can always plug those in and check. If I let x be equal to 1, does it come out to be true? If I let x be equal to 3 fifths, does it come out to be true? I'll go ahead and take the one on the next page, solve using the quadratic formula. All right, very first thing to do, we need everything on one side set equal to 0, and the ax squared term has to be positive, so we're going to keep him here and move the other two to the left. So I've got 2x squared plus 7x minus 4 is equal to 0. A value is 2, B is 7, C was negative 4. Once we have those, we just need to plug them in and simplify down. So I've got X equals negative B plus or minus B squared minus 4 times A times C all over 2A. We have to be careful with those signs. They are very important. So let's start simplifying x equals negative 7 plus or minus square root of what on the inside? 49 plus, since I have negative times a negative, I've got 16 times 2. So I'm adding 32 on the inside, and that's all over 4. 
So 49 and 32 gives me 81 on the inside. And what is the square root of 81? 9. So again, we have two options. So x is either equal to negative 7 plus 9 divided by 4, which is going to give us what? So I've got 2 fourths, which is 1 half. Or my other option, x is going to be equal to negative 7 minus 9 over 4. So we're looking at negative 16. Negative 16 over 4, which comes out to be negative 4. So again, we've got two values that can make this equation true. Negative 4 and positive 1 half. If you aren't convinced, we can always plug it back into the original, check and make sure that it's true.